Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Condit. I'm an attorney here in Portland. I'm also an adjunct instructor in the uh, School of Planning here at Portland State. And most importantly, I am a member of the planning committee. Uh, before we get started, we have a couple of announcements. The first person I'd like to bring up is uh, Ben Davey. He's got a couple of announcements. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, after the keynote speech, and I'm very much looking forward to it, there will be a heated debate. And after the heated debate, there will be a brown bag general assembly. So we will change the program. We will not have a whatever one hour break so that everybody can dwindle away. We will immediately have the General Assembly, and this is uh, a great honor for me to remind you to uh, the statutory foundation of PLPR. Uh, under the statutes, every participant of a conference, of our annual conferences, uh, is admitted and invited to the General Assembly, so please, even if you have never heard of PLPR before, I know by now you will be convinced that this is something you are going to continue to uh, um, visit our conferences. Please, everybody uh, is really invited to stay for the General Assembly and to join in uh, our uh, group discussion uh, over a number of things, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, thank you, Ben. I'd next I'd like to call uh, my uh, colleague and fellow committee member, Steve Schell, to the stand. Um, we, uh, we've spent uh, 15 meetings in somebody's office somewhere at Garvey Schubert, and it just went on and on. but. All in all, it was a most enjoyable time, and uh, we really appreciate what, Ed, you've done in getting this conference here. Uh, so the organizing committee and others have joined together to uh, provide you a little uh, special recognition at this point. So my, uh, my job is to maybe roast you a little, but toast you most, <laughs> specifically, um, the, uh, as you all know, and as the introduction that Cy gave, the good introduction, uh, Ed was county counsel at, and uh, did the Fasano case. Uh, he and I worked together on the Baker case. He was the, the uh, counsel to Bob Straub, the, our governor, and, and he has been a stalwart in the intellectual development of land use in Oregon since, I think, even before I knew him. Um, he, was, he was there uh, talking about the ideas, about the, the points, and arguing the cases as well. Um, specifically, I, I was with uh, Henry Richmond, uh, who helped start uh, 1,000 Friends uh, roughly um, 20 years, 30 years ago, I guess now, 35, no, almost 40 years now. Um, and, and, but anyway, Henry recently said, uh, whenever I go to... Uh, a conference or a meeting on the academics of land use, who do I see? It's always Ed Sullivan. So we're appreciative of that, Ed, and I, I think in, in honor of that, we need a limerick for you, so I, I have a little offer for you. So there once was a man named Ed, and uh, Fasano and, and Younger were his bed. So the PL, he told us the PLPR was nice, and so we followed his advice, and we went wherever he led. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Ed, if, you, if you'd come up, uh, I'd like to present this, this uh, gift to you, and, and uh, congratulations. We, we appreciate your work, not just on PLPR, but for the last 40 years. Now, that's a special book on uh, Julian, the ost uh, apostate. And the truth is that Ed is Latin and Greek educated. And he's still studying. 
This is right down his line, except it's about an apostate, and I hope he never becomes a, an apostate for the land use process. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Ed, for everything you've done. Um, uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Lee Fennell. Uh, Lee is the Max Pam Professor of Law and the Herbert and Marjorie Freed Research Scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, her talk today is sponsored by the Walter Cross Economics Lecture Fund at Reed College. On behalf of the committee, I'd really like to thank Reed for making her available to us today. Uh, Lee is the author of numerous uh, 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 topics such as on property, torts, land use, housing, social welfare, state and local government law, public finance, and she's the author of the highly influential book, which I have a copy of here, uh, The Unbounded Home, Property Values Beyond Property Lines. Uh, today's talk will focus on professor, uh, the, another interest of Professor Fennell's uh, commons, anti-commons, and semi-commons. Uh, Optional plan, planning today. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah. my. Doing talk later today. I'm going to have to talk to uh, Noel about the script. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. <laughs> Fennell. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be part of this conference, and I really enjoyed the sessions this morning. I'm really here more to learn from you, um, but, but this, this is terrific. The first thing you might wonder about is my title, uh, Optional Planning. I realize that I am at a conference of, of planners at PLPR, and that, um, and that it might seem a little bit heretical to say that planning is optional. Um, so let me first try to reassure you that I don't really think that, I, that planning is optional in the sense of being inessential. I actually think it's not only essential, it's inevitable. Uh, Hayek actually made the point um, in a very influential paper that if we think about planning as sort of figuring out what to do with resources through society, there's always planning going on. It's always just a question of what scale the planning is happening at. Are we all following our own individual separate plans? Um, are we coordinating those plans somehow? Uh, is the planning happening at some larger scale? Is it happening at the municipal level, the county level, the regional level, or along some other lines that might not even be geographic? Okay, so why then do I have the uh, title of optional planning? Well, I mean the, sense, uh, I mean the term optional in a couple of senses, uh, and the first of those pays homage to a 2005 book by Ian Ayers, legal scholar, called Optional Law. And it turns out that Ian Ayers is not uh, an anarchist. He doesn't think that law is or should be optional. But he does think, and I agree, that sometimes law and also land use planning can benefit from using some uh, design features that are associated with financial options, that are associated with the idea of giving someone an, an option to exercise. Okay, and so there's some places where law looks like this. Let me just go to the first slide here. And this is a little uh, cocktail napkin uh, version of a call option. And um, you don't really need to focus too much on the details of this, but just the basic shape. It kind of looks a little like that tide picture we were seeing before. Um, at, at any rate, the idea is that you start off uh, when, when you purchase a, a call option, you start off by paying something for the option. That's why you start off a little bit below the zero line. Um, but that's all you stand to lose. Basically, then, if it turns out that the thing that you have an option to purchase starts to become valuable enough, if you are in the money, then you can go ahead and exercise that option and capture some of that upside. Okay? And law sometimes works a little bit like this. If we think about something like um, a permit to engage in emitting something, if you're a factory, uh, and it costs you some amount to purchase that permit, you can think about that as kind of being like an option. Um, if it turns out that it starts to be in the money for you, that you're making enough money as a result of the production process that creates these emissions, then you can exercise that option, pay that fee, and go forward. Uh, and so we can imagine a lot of instances that might be kind of like that, where the law gives you a choice, 
And what's interesting to me about this, what's especially interesting from a planning perspective, is that it's a way of getting information. It's a way of harnessing information. You learn something when you see somebody exercising an option, um, when you see that it's worth it to them to pay something in order to, in order to get some, some uh, potential use in exchange. Okay, so that's one sense in which I want to use the term optional and think about ways to explore that analogy. Uh, the other sense in which I mean the term optional is thinking about optional involvement in planning. And here I mean getting uh, citizens uh, involved, getting volunteers involved in all kinds of ways in uh, providing inputs into planning. And we've already heard about this this morning. We've heard about um, some ways that can actually go awry, uh, you know, planning goal number one. Um, but what I want to focus on here are some ways of kind of trying to, cl to crowdsource uh, planning by allowing people to provide uh, sometimes real-time inputs using various apps that now exist um, and provide information. Okay, and so we'll talk about some examples of this uh, as, as we go along, um, but the thing I want to emphasize at the outset is both of these two things that I'm talking about with optional planning have to do with information. Okay, with, with trying to make better use of information, trying to harness the dispersed information that already exists out in the world in many hands, and finding techniques to do that, whether it means getting people to volunteer um, and uh, you know, provide us with inputs and provide us with information about conditions in their neighborhood or conditions in a waterway they have access to, or whether we're talking about getting information from people as we watch the choices they make when the law structures something like an option and gives them the chance to, to, to purchase something or not. Either way, we're gathering information. And um, I want to spend the, the rest of the talk um, talking about three areas of what I call remediable ignorance, um, areas in which land use planning proceeds, sort of necessarily proceeds without full information. Uh, I first want to say I don't mean the word ignorance in kind of a pejorative sense. Um, it's often rational to not gather all the information that might be out there in the world. It's expensive to get it. Uh, what I'm interested in are places where it might become cheaper to get some of the information and where that might help with, with the planning process. Okay, so the first of these is land use impacts. We have a lot of information about land use impacts already, but there's a lot that we actually don't know about how it impacts people on the ground, and there might be ways to, to get more of that. Okay, um, there's a lot we also don't know about land use intentions. What people plan to do with their land next if they're in a zone where they're permitted to do some additional things beyond what they're already doing, are they going to do that or are they not going to do that? Um, it would help us if we could know that, and the law has some ways of finding out, but we still are often in the dark. And then the third area of uh, remediable ignorance is preferences for land use patterns. We're only able to really observe what people do uh, in kind of a binary way. They move into an area, they move out of an area. It's hard to know what their preferences are for patterns of land use, especially patterns of land use that don't exist yet, but that might exist. Very hard to get that information by just watching how people move in and out of areas um, because we're just observing their reactions to what might be a limited choice set. And we might also be in a realm, this focuses on some things Thomas Schelling uh, explored, we might be in a realm where their choice kind of uh, has, has this sort of perpetuating effect on the existing pattern. Uh, they're entrenching it without even meaning to because there are some options that don't exist. Okay, so in thinking about this, um, first of all, I wanted to focus on the impact question and uh, think about ways that it might be possible to involve people more in providing information about impacts. Um, and there's some reasons why I think this could be helpful and could be uh, useful in, in, uh, as an input into planning. Um, there are starting to be apps, this is one example, AirProbe, I haven't tried this app, uh, but it, it is supposed to be something that can hook up to a kind of a sensor box of some kind and collect real-time data about air quality. The Bucket Brigade is a little bit lower tech, not um, smartphone based, but uh, another way of collecting, uh, giving communities the way to collect information about air quality in their area. Okay, if we have people sort of voluntarily getting involved in this, providing information about impacts, we now have the ability to map all this information and to get a lot of details about how different uses potentially, different land uses have spillover effects on others. Um, and and this, this could be very valuable. Here's another example of an app. 
called Wide Noise, um, which, uh, again, I haven't, haven't actually tried this app. I'll be curious if anyone has. Um, but it purports to be able to pick up uh, sort of sound readings and figure out how loud uh, a particular uh, use is that might be near you. Uh, it's supposed to actually be able to give you the decibels for the area that, that you're in. And um, then this too can be aggregated onto a map. If you have enough people using this app collecting samples, you can learn a lot about whether um, particular kinds of adjacent uses are going to be too noisy to, to coexist happily. Um, the sort of earlier versions of this app actually used the, the scale that's kind of at the top of the, of, of the slide here where uh, they kind of roughly categorized uh, the loudness of a sound based on whether it was more like a feather, more like a dinosaur, uh, who, who, knows, who knows what that sounds like, um, or, um, or you know, more like a rock concert. But now it seems like they give readings in decibels. And um, again, an interesting uh, way of showing how we might get people more involved out there in collecting information. Um, why might this help us to collect information in these ways? Um, well, it might help us in just improving sort of traditional uh, zoning and traditional land use controls because it might help us do better at figuring out what should be the right classifications, uh, what should be in the same zone, where uh, zones should be adjacent to each other. It might be helpful for that. Um, maybe more ambitiously, it might help to facilitate a shift to performance zoning, which uh, has never, as I understand it, really taken off in a big way but would be a form of zoning that's not based on classifying based on uses, but it's based on uh, ruling out particular kinds of impacts. So you might say, you can put any use you want in this spot, but nobody off of the property, need, uh, we need to have it where nobody can detect um, a noise level above a certain decibel level, or where we can't have um, air degradation below a certain part per million, um, those kinds of things, the, the sort of, problem with performance zoning has traditionally been, it's extremely hard to enforce it. Um, you can't really figure out whether people are within the performance standards. Well, if we start to have everybody walking around with smartphones able to measure stuff all the time, then that might actually change. Um, it might also give us some, uh, a little bit of, of clout, potentially, against some uh, nimbyism in some settings. Uh, sometimes, Bill Fischel has suggested, homeowners uh, are not, they're not really against um, particular uses uh, because they're certain that they would be a problem. It's just they're risk averse. Their home is their, their largest single investment. They're really worried about property values, and so they just don't want a risk of something near them that might have an impact. If we could get information about actual impacts, that might be a way to try to, um, try to address or, or counterspeak some of the nimbyism. Okay, um, shifting gears just a little bit, I wanna um, uh, talk about this other meaning of optional that I mentioned at the outset, thinking of analogies to financial options and how those could help us get information about impacts and about the values that, place, that people place on, on particular uses or, or particular impacts. And so to do that, to set that up, I wanna shift for a second from land to water and talk about uh, a, an old admiralty rule called general average contribution. And um, then, then don't worry, we'll tie it back to, uh, to planning and land use. Um, this maritime rule was one that tried to solve a practical problem that was faced by captains at sea. Okay, so imagine that you're a captain out at sea and you've got everybody's shipment on board and there's some terrible storm. Um, it turns out you can save the ship, you can save the rest of the shipments if you throw some stuff overboard. Um, but, you know, what are you going to pick? Whose stuff are you going to throw overboard? And what are you going to do, like, when you, you know, get into port and you don't have their stuff? I mean, how are you going to compensate them? Okay, and so general average contribution tried to answer those questions. It did so kind of in this, in this elegant way. It let each shipper place a value on their shipment. Okay, so you say your shipment is worth, your box that you're shipping, it's worth $300. That's what you say. Okay, um, how do we get them to give an honest value? Well, you attach two consequences to it that push them in different directions. Uh, so that when there's a, when there's a storm, there's, there's two different ways that this 300 might matter. Okay, if your cargo is thrown overboard, that's the amount you collect. Okay, um, but if someone else's cargo is tossed, then you have to contribute to compensate them in proportion to your own valuation. 
Okay, so this, this keeps you from doing some really, if you do some really high value, well, your stuff probably won't get thrown into the sea, but you might get stuck with a big bill, okay? Um, and, and, and conversely, if you try to really be cheap on this, uh, you, you give a very, very low amount, then you might not get compensated enough, okay? So the question is, this is kind of a neat device. Can we, can we find ways to use this in thinking about land use controls? And um, I'm going to show, show you an example that's sort of a very small scale example. Um, but I think there might be ways to scale it up and think about it as uh, if we sort of were, were, to, were to do it in many different ways, it might actually offer uh, some sort of organic ways to get in, into certain kinds of, of, of planning. Okay, so here is um, the lawn flamingo. Okay, um, and uh, you know, some people have these in their yards, and some people would be happier if the other people didn't have them in their yards. Okay, and so let's imagine that we have a community where um, we have some people that want to put flamingos in their yards, and we have some other people that say, look, um, you know, if some of my neighbors put flamingos in their yards, it's okay if like a couple of them do it, like with a couple of flamingos, but I don't want my neighborhood to be the kind of neighborhood where everybody has a flamingo in the yard because it's just gonna get a reputation and I don't like that, someone might say. I, I don't really have an opinion on flamingos myself. Um, if you have strong feelings about something else like garden gnomes or uh, boats in the driveway or whatever it might be, um, feel free to fill that in. Okay, so what we might do is we might say, well, um, you know, yeah, go ahead, put your flamingo in the yard if you're in this community, but you need to place a value on how much it's worth it to you to have that flamingo in your yard. And we're going to assess you some kind of a fee that is proportionate to the value that you pick. That's going to be a little tax that you have to pay to have your flamingo out there. And if we get to the point where it seems like we have too many, um, you know, if, if, if the community decides, look, we, this, is, this is getting out of control, we need to flexibly respond to the fact that too many people are out there paying the flamingo tax, putting their flamingo out there, then there'd be the possibility of actually, you know, uh, going in and buying them back. This is sort of the price you can buy them back for, perhaps. Um, so, you know, we get rid of the, the ones that are kind of cheap, uh, perhaps, or maybe there's other criteria that's applied to figure out which ones to remove. Um, but it effectively gives the community options. And it gives the community options that are sort of made by the people who are in, who are in, the, uh, who are in the community. Okay, so this is efficient flamingo remediation uh, through entitlement subject to self-made options. This is just a little acronym that I made up, ESMOs. Um, simple idea though, try to come up with some kind of way of uh, stating what, this, what it's worth to you to engage in this use, and then that effectively writes an option for, uh, for the community. Okay, um, so let's um, shift for a second here to the second area of, of ignorance that I talked, that I mentioned before, and that's with respect to land use intentions. Um, we don't often know what people are planning to do with their property, and there's a couple of ways that we can try to address that ignorance, and they're both they're both imperfect. Um, one way that we try to address that ignorance, in part, is there's a lot of legal doctrines that actually favor people that you get more property rights, the more you take your plans forward towards actualizing them. So the more you do to make your plan a reality, uh, you turn it, you might get vested rights, depending on the, the vesting rules in your jurisdiction, or once it's an existing use, it may be very hard for the community to change the rules and make you change your use or make you get rid of your use without, without uh, some kind of uh, chance to amortize that out or some kind of compensation. So you get some protections once you actually are engaging in, um, in a use or you've taken enough steps down that path. Um, there's a social cost to this. This, is, this, is, this forces information. Um, the fact that we protect you more once you show us what you're actually going to do um, means that it tends to push people towards developing uh, or towards actualizing their plans more quicker than they otherwise would, but that might actually be costly. We're forcing information, but maybe we're also forcing development. The other thing that the law often does um, that helps to try to figure out what people intend to do is just don't give them any choices, right? Just narrow the range of permissible uses in an area so that almost everyone is already kind of at the maximum intensity that's permitted in that zone. So that there's not a lot else, there's not a lot of surprises about what people might choose to do later. Um, and so this too has uh, the problem of removing flexibility. Um, the question is whether we could, do, we could do better. Is there a way that we could actually use an options idea to add some alternatives and to try to get information from people about what they plan to do and make a little better use of that in a way that would, that would let us avoid some land use conflicts. 
Okay, so let me just give you a little example here. Um, again, a very small scale example, but, uh, but maybe will help to illustrate. Um, let's suppose that we have these two neighbors and the uh, neighbor on your right uh, wants to put up a solar panel. Um, the people on the left right now, are, they're not doing anything on their property that would block the sun from hitting the solar panels and from powering the house of their neighbor. Uh, but let's suppose that under the existing restrictions, they would be permitted, if they wanted to, to grow really tall trees or build a, an addition on their house or something like that that would actually block, um, block the light. Okay, let's suppose that, that they have that option available. Well, this ends up being a problem because the, the solar neighbors, maybe they haven't actually purchased their panels yet, they, they, they don't know whether it's worth investing in the solar panels because it might be that the next day their neighbors start to, uh, start to put something really huge next door. And so um, they, might try to, they might try to bargain with them. They might go next door and say, look, what we really want is a solar easement. We want you to agree to not build up um, even though the law allows you to do so, or, or at least could you tell us what your plans are or something. Um, it's sort of hard to see on the slide, but, but it might be the case that the couple, uh, you know, that the couple with the, uh, the, the people who live in the solar house um, write some kind of a note, make some kind of offer to the other people who just sort of set it on fire or something like that. Um, say, you know, go away. We don't, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to hear about dealing with you. Um, they, they may be suspicious of their neighbors. They may not, uh, they may try to extract more from them in this bargaining process. It might end up being a problem. Okay, the, one of the issues when neighbors are next to each other is that they're in this kind of bilateral monopoly situation with each other. And so it's not like you can just go and deal with some other neighbor often. This might be the only solar path available, right? And the only sort of likely buyer of a solar easement might be the, the solar family. Okay, so um, we might have a problem that they just end up growing some trees and, and then the solar people have lost their investment. And what could we do? Is there anything we could do to, to make this better? Okay, um, I, I've suggested in, in, um, in, in one, one paper that I wrote that we might have something like uh, a local governmentally uh, offered options exchange that would operate like this. And I'm, I'm here representing, unfortunately, the local government as being this kind of bureaucratic looking blue building up on the hill there in the middle. Um, so, you know, you, you can fill in, I didn't have very good clip art, but fill in your favorite local government building. Um, the idea here would be if we have some neighbors, we might have neighbor A, and we might sort of have uh, other people in the community that are similarly situated. The, the, the options exchange people might say to people in the community, look, um, we know that some people in this community want to put up solar panels. We're aware of that. That's, that's something that's come to our attention. Um, and so we know that there's gonna be an interest. There's gonna be some demand for solar easements. Um, and we don't know exactly what that demand will be, but what we'd like to do, we, the, the government, the options exchange, is we'd like to buy up some options on solar easements. We'd like to buy up the chance to, uh, to actually um, sell other people in the community these, these um, solar easements. We think it would make our community a better place to live if people could move in knowing that they could get an easement that would let them have free access to the sunlight. Okay, so what would that look like? Well, the first step of the transaction would be that the local government would pay some amount of money, uh, would offer an amount of money, if you will basically give them an option on a solar easement. Okay, what does that mean? It means that if um, later someone wants to exercise an option on the solar easement, they want to actually put in solar panels and keep you from putting anything that would block it, they would have that right if they exercise the option. So neighbor B, who wants to put up a solar panel, might come along later and purchase this option and exercise it. And then they would be the proud owner of a solar easement. Uh, the neighbors would have gotten some money and the sun would shine and all would be well. Um, what's the advantage of doing it this way instead of just letting the neighbors bargain? Well, there's the bargaining problems I mentioned before. Um, this allows people to say what they, to basically signal what they intend to do. When they sell that option on a solar easement, they're representing effectively that they don't really plan to do anything like build up. And that information is valuable. Um, it also lets people who want to put in solar panels, they could go to the local government website and look at like a map and see where they could be able to acquire solar easements. It could help them choose where to locate. Okay, so we might actually have um, the ability of just putting an intermediary there. 
who can help coordinate, um, that, it would, that it would actually help to uh, let people engage in sort of an organic form of planning at, at a small scale. Okay, um, let me just uh, move to the third kind of area of, um, of uh, remediable ignorance that I mentioned before. This is preferences for land use patterns. Um, we can only observe choices, as I mentioned before, between existing patterns. People move in, they move out. Um, Thomas Schelling, Nobel laureate, noted that sometimes these choices can entrench or unravel existing patterns. Uh, he did a lot of work thinking about this in the context of integration um, and segregation and the fact that if you start off with like two segregated neighborhoods that the choices that individual people make about moving into neighborhoods might perpetuate that. Um, similarly, you might have other kinds of dynamics that would happen in changing neighborhoods. But the point is broader than just that. Um, there's similar issues about what kind of patterns people want for land use with respect to you know, do we want to have this be an area that's all residential? Do we want it to be an area where we have some shops mixed in? Do we want a mix of apartment buildings and single family homes? There's lots of questions about how to pattern land use that um, we don't necessarily get good, good information about because those choices don't yet exist. And you can't choose what isn't there. Another issue here, and this goes to a point about, I think about visualization that was raised earlier, um, that people may be unable to even form preferences for things that don't exist yet. If, there, if there's something like a particular kind of high density environment that actually might be, might be good in certain ways, um, if, it, if, it were, if there were certain other elements that existed alongside it, they may not be able to form a preference if they haven't experienced it, if they don't actually see examples of it. Okay, so what can we do to make that better? Is there anything we can do to solve that problem? Well, um, we could try to, this is a, a screenshot of an of a online simulation that was adapted from um, Thomas Schelling's work on, on segregation. And there's a few of these computer programs, it's a little hard to see probably in the back, but it's red and green dots basically, um, where these, these computer programmers have worked out simulations that try to show, and uh, unfortunately I can't show you one of these actually running, but, but um, if you actually run one of these simulations, you see the red and the green dots moving all around in various patterns, and then finally uh, usually coming to some kind of equilibrium where they stop moving around. And they move around in these simulations in response to rules that the programmer gives them. And in this context, exploring segregation as Schelling did, uh, the rules that they're given are like, if, if, you're, if you're a green dot, maybe you want a certain number of your neighbors to also be green dots, right? Or you want a certain number of your neighbors to not be red dots or, or something, or you want some particular mix. And you can then sort of look at how, whether they're unhappy in the spot that they're in and whether they move around. And so there's these agent-based models that try to model this stuff. And they, they've, I think it's been interesting and helpful um, already. The question is whether we can use these kinds of ideas and maybe get more people involved, again, turning to the idea of optional in terms of people providing their own input, would we be able to potentially do better in thinking about what people are looking for in land use patterns, and maybe as important, figuring out what would happen if we were to pursue certain patterns, what kinds of, of later changes might we see? What kind of um, shifts might we see in reaction to that? Okay, so we might, we might imagine getting people involved in playing some of these games online. Um, we could, uh, whoops, sorry, didn't mean to go that far. Um, the, uh, we might get some people involved in playing um, games online where they actually play the role of one of these dots. And again, it doesn't have to be just about segregation, it can be about lots of things. Like what would you do if, uh, you know, how many, how many residences do you need to have near you in order to feel like you're in a residential neighborhood that you, that, that's, um, that's the kind of place where you wanna raise your family? To what extent are certain kinds of adjacent uses bad enough that you would move away? Okay, so we can imagine getting people involved in providing input, and there's actually been some work already that's already being done along these lines that tries to model it on the massively multiplayer online games that already exist, like World of Warcraft, which I've never played. Maybe some people have tried it. But, um, yeah? Oh, okay. So, um, great, you can, you can tell us. Uh, uh, so, the idea would be, and there, there's some folks who are working on some projects like this, like World of Citycraft, I think is one of them, where uh, you actually try to get people 
involved in, um, in playing these sort of online simulated games, and you might be able to learn a lot about, about preferences for patterns by doing this. Um, at, at a minimum, you might be able to gather information that would help us design better agent-based models. I mentioned before the programmers, for example, in this example, would give rules to the individual dots about when to move. Well, that depends on what we, you know, when do we think people are going to initiate moves um, in, in response to something that happens, something that changes in their environment. We might be able to learn about that, potentially. Um, and we might also be able to just get people directly, more directly involved in, uh, in running some simulations. Um, okay, so I guess what I want to sort of next go to here is to think about what's, what's left for planners and local government. I mentioned a bunch of ways that we might get, um, we might use this idea of, of optional planning to both get people involved in supplying information that could be used as an input into, into planning, and, um, and then also using certain option-based mechanisms uh, that, that might operate in, in a way that would substitute to some degree for um, just uh, rules that would, that would limit outright, you know, sort of command and control rules about what to do. You might instead give people options and see whether they exercise them or not. And I, I sort of defended my title at the beginning and said I didn't think that planning was optional. Um, you might be starting to wonder, though, by this point in the talk, whether I think that planners are optional and whether eventually uh, all this stuff can just be done with people with smartphones and we can have all these uh, market-like mechanisms and we can aggregate everything and we don't have to have this idea of the social planner who's trying to figure out what to do. Okay, so in fact, I think that we still have to have real involvement uh, of planners and of local governments um, along a few different dimensions. Uh, the first of these is about getting people to participate optimally. Okay, we might worry both about um, people not participating uh, if we do something like some initiative where we want to gather a lot of information about land use impacts. Well, we might worry about um, sort of the, the people who, who participate might not be representative. So maybe the people who get the wide noise app uh, on, their, on their phone are not like right at the median of noise tolerance, right? Like, like maybe, maybe not. And maybe they don't always pick um, the sort of average uh, time of day when there's noise next door to do the reading. Okay, so we might want to have a lot of thought go into how are we going to gather information? How are we going to avoid self-selection? How are we going to avoid um, biased participation? How are we going to avoid people um, participating in ways that, that's going to distort our results? Okay, um, and so, so that's sort of our, that's one, one thing here. Let me just give you a, uh, an, an example to kind of think about, about uh, some of the ways that local governments might actually get kind of creative about this. Um, and that, that relates to the idea that whenever you are a, a local governmental unit that is making a decision, it's often the case that lots of people who don't live in that jurisdiction are affected, right? This is sort of the point of having some kind of regional planning. Um, but in places where we have a lot of fragmented local government and not, and not a regional planning, uh, not any kind of strong form of regional planning, then there's always this question about, you know, what about the people who are outside of the jurisdiction? And of course, they're not part of the political community, but should we still be getting information from them somehow? And perhaps we could more flexibly do that if we started to offer some of these alternatives for letting people contribute. So I wanted to show you this map, and it's, it's not because I think it's, it's accurate. The, the creator of it admits that it's wildly inaccurate. But um, there's a guy, Michael Baldwin, who's been trying to sort of figure out, and this is the New York area. He's been trying to figure out um, where the sort of real perceived boundaries are for different areas as opposed to where the actual political boundaries are. Okay, so I don't know if you can see it on the slide. There's some white lines here that are the political boundaries. And he did a survey of some people, and you know, he admits he's only got a small sample, um, but this is for sort of a demonstration of the idea that people identify with areas that are different than their political boundaries sometimes. Um, he also did something like this where he, where he did all, all the states to kind of figure out what major city people identify with. Um, so uh, this, this might be helpful to us if we start to think about where the impact zones are of decisions that are made locally. And this is a place where we really have to have some kind of planning involved. We might have to have some kind of even regional um, approach involved in thinking about how to solicit information, how to use information. And this is something that, um, that, that we can't sort of get at just by saying, everybody turn on your smartphones. We have to figure out whose uh, who's, who's impact information is going to count and how that's going to count. 
Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that planners and local government can continue to do is use behavioral insights to try to frame choices. This phrase relates a little bit to some of the issues with, um, with citizen participation that came up earlier. Um, one of the problems sort of, I think, with, with, with NIMBYism generally is that oftentimes you see choices being presented one at a time to people who like the status quo. And they're always comparing the status quo to the new thing that might be risky. It might, it might um, drive down their home values. They're not sure what will happen. And so they don't really want it. And then you give them something else, you give another option, sort of seriatim, a bunch of different choices. No, 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 uh, none of those seem good. Um, another way of thinking about this that might be facilitated by getting people more involved uh, in, in kind of on a volunteer basis in providing input is you could try to frame some choices through online interfaces, not as you know, status quo versus this, status quo versus this, but rather we're going to put something here. Let's talk about comparing the alternatives that might be added, okay? So that their baseline isn't the status quo and defending that, it's like the baseline is we're gonna have a change, let's, let's shape what it will be, let's get input into what it will be. Um, an example that it doesn't fully uh, fit the NIMBYism uh, framework, but an example to kind of give an idea is in Bristol, they have started doing uh, some online solicitation of uh, sort of how a, a downtown area would be developed. And people just submit their ideas, like I think there should be, a, you know, a Polish restaurant, or there should be an affordable grocery store in this one in this one certain area to try to imagine different possibilities. And if we think about those as alternatives to each other, rather than as alternatives to the status quo, that might reframe some things. And just having people more more involved in trying to imagine what the future of a particular area might be like could be could be quite helpful. Okay. Um, the third thing I wanted to mention, I think, is really important. Um, which is this idea of pursuing normative commitments, okay? So a lot of times when we sort of think about harnessing all this information and um, sort, of, sort of an economic way maybe of, of thinking about trying to, um, trying to get information for using it in, in land use planning is that we're sort of at some level trying to replicate the kind of perfect bargains that we would have among everyone if only everyone could, could bargain with each other. Um, well, that's not the entire story. It's not just about aggregating what everybody wants and figuring out sort of, uh, sort of you know, aggregating all the information together and then spitting out a result. We have normative commitments that governments have kind of a non-delegable duty to try to pursue. And so we have to, we have to take that into account as well. And there are, there are instances in which the way that we gather information, right, um, may need to reflect some of those commitments. And I'm talking about things like commitments to anti-discrimination and commitments maybe to, to environmental quality. Um, there might be things that we want to take off the table when we're gathering all this information and all this input from the community. And um, we, it, we might also find instances where information is um, creating uh, some kind of conflict with a normative commitment and we might want to respond somehow. I'll give you just one example um, that uh, came up fairly recently uh, involving an app. Um, Microsoft, in their patent application for the pedestrian root production app, uh, mentioned that one of the things that it could do, it, it basically it's an app where you say, I want to go from point A to point B. And um, one of the things that it promised that it could do is you could, you could choose to be taken through neighborhoods that have violent crime statistics below a certain threshold, okay? Now, this sounds, you know, well, you know, you don't, you don't want to go through violent crime, of course, but, um, but the concern was, of course, that this might uh, kind of stigmatize neighborhoods. It might, it might have this self-perpetuating effect, right? I mean, if you, if you tell people, these are the dangerous neighborhoods, don't go in them, then no one goes in them. They become more dangerous, become self-fulfilling. It, it entrenches in certain ways. And so I, I don't think the answer for this, by the way, is to try to suppress Microsoft's uh, pedestrian root production thing, but rather we could kind of harness this information. We could say, look, this is, um, th this, this is what this root production thing is spitting out. Maybe this means that these are areas where we need to pour more resources into it or we need to do something. Uh, we need to actually take additional steps to try to make those areas uh, more walkable, uh, more, more friendly to pedestrians and so on. Um, so, so again, there may be places where just aggregating the information or just uh, making use of information might lead us to a place we don't want to be. We still need the active involvement of planners. We still need the active involvement of, of government in, um, in, in doing this. Okay, so um, just to sort of wrap up a little bit, uh, I, I hope to have suggested to you that even though planning is not optional in the sense of 
being inessential, uh, that there's ways that we can try to think about the planning project. And the way I think about the planning project is as trying to, um, trying to address problems of, uh, of incompatibilities in the way that we use resources, especially land. And getting more information and finding ways to harness that information is really crucial. And some of the ways that we might be able to do that better, I think, would involve um, effectively giving people options um, and seeing how they respond to those, and then also just getting more people involved in the process optionally as, uh, as, as citizen participants. So I, I will stop there and see if people have questions. Any questions? Yeah, of course. Okay, uh, Lee will take questions. Uh, if you do have a question, come on up so everybody can hear it and uh, she'll respond. Questions? Lee, two, two related questions. Um, Zillow is functioning. Yep. Zillow has walk scores. Have you thought about how to use walk scores and the other mechanisms that Zillow has as a practical application of your information? And then the related question is, I think it's Putnam and Bowling Alone talks about, in essence, walking with your feet. So I think Portland, to some extent, is a function of walking with your feet. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was young, we used to have the West Hills full of, of moderate Republicans. They're gone. Uh, people have walked with their feet. And, and the, 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 the question I have is, how do you relate those ideas to your thesis, those two ideas? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, so first of all, on Zillow, I, I do think that's a, that's a great example of sort of an existing information aggregation thing that's out there, and it's a question of trying to figure out how to harness it. One of the interesting features of Zillow, uh, other than the one that you mentioned about walkability, is they actually have something that's kind of like an option idea where they have, uh, you, can, you can value your house, make me move. Has anybody seen this make me move thing? You can say, um, you can put a price on your house and say, my house isn't really for sale, but you could make me move if you paid this amount. It's not like a legally binding option, um, but, it, but it's sort of this interesting thing that kind of gets at, at some of the things that, that, I, that I was thinking about in terms of you know, trying to figure out what people are, are up to and what they're thinking about. Um, voting with the feet. Uh, yeah, so, so this is uh, the Tebow hypothesis, and I, I, I'm sure Putnam talked about this as well, um, is this idea that you just sort of locate into uh, jurisdictions that match what you want. And so you, so you go into the one that, that fits with your preferences. Um, I think that that's true to an, certainly true to an extent that people do this. They sort themselves out. Um, I guess the question is whether sorting is a complete solution to our problems. Um, can, we, can we count on the right kind of mixes of different uh, sets of, of goods and services, different ways of living being provided so that people have all the options that they want? Um, are there dynamics that get set up in metro areas where you have a bunch of little jurisdictions where if one jurisdiction does something, um, it, it may have spillover effects on other jurisdictions. Uh, if, you know, if one jurisdiction says something like, you know, I, I, we don't want affordable housing here, um, it might actually lead others not to sort of compete for the affordable housing and offer a different vision, but rather say, oh yeah, us too, because now that um, some of our neighbors are, are pushing away affordable housing, we don't want it to spill over into us. So sometimes you don't end up with the full range of choices that you want. Um, the other issue is just that people are sorting on a bunch of different dimensions. And so some of the things, they're always getting a bundled product when they go and choose to live in a certain place. You're getting all the laws that go with that. You're getting the zoning. You're getting whatever uh, natural amenities are near you and so on. And um, you know, so, so I, I think that sometimes we don't actually see just from observing where people go what they actually would want if they could kind of confront the unbundled elements of that, right? It might be that there's something there that people would love to get rid of or add and, and there's just not that choice available. So I, I think trying to simulate some additional choices and see what people do, you know, even through online simulations would, would be really helpful in trying to address this problem of people can't pick what doesn't yet exist. Thank you so much for your talk, Lee. That was very delightful. Uh, as a planner and as a European, um, I would like to sort of reflect on the 
two different options for planners. On the one hand, the planner um, as Godfather or as the Leviathan, uh, towering over the land and doing good things and protecting public interest. And on the other hand, the planner is a sort of beekeeper who is uh, in, in charge of moderating swarm intelligence. Uh -huh. Over the past uh, years, uh, technology has emerged and entered into our lives that uh, if it uh, goes according to Apple and others, is supposed to g give us better access to communication and to engage in acts that uh, help us tap into our swarm intelligence. Um, but what I really see is people sitting in restaurants, uh, everybody is on their smartphones, and nobody is talking to each other any longer. Uh, so I'm sort of um, interested in what is the uh, impact on the democratic quality of planning if we sort of um, retreat as planners to uh, mod moderating uh, people who are using apps, maybe in responsible ways, but maybe not. Okay. Okay. So I, I like I like the swarm uh, swarm intelligence idea and the, the beekeeper metaphor. And so yeah, I guess I guess I come out saying yeah that, that that part of it is wanting to capture the intelligence that's out there and disperse, but that we still have to be I don't know hive designers or whatever. We have we have to still figure out. Um, there still has to be a, a role in figuring out what to do. The other part of your comment, I think, was going to this idea, are we making, may, maybe it was, that maybe we're making things worse. If we try to give people more things to do with their, with their smartphones and we're telling them to go out and gather more information for us, that we're just uh, contributing to the fact that everyone's like attached to a smartphone all the time and that nobody talks to each other anymore. Um, so, so I guess that, that, might, that might be a concern. One, one, one aspect of, um, of sort of using smartphone apps is it kind of addresses the sort of Oscar Wilde objection that, you know, the, the this was about socialism, but you could say it about about any any sort of public endeavor that it takes too many evenings. You have to go to too many too many meetings, um, and so if we already have people who are on their smartphones all the time, this may be the public participation that we can, you know, the best that we can hope for given current conditions. The question of whether people should spend less time on their smartphones maybe is a bigger one that, than I can answer. Um, yeah. But we, we give them better places to live. Maybe that'll that'll help them out a little bit. Help <laughs> much. Um, about options, um, one of the nice things about being rich, I am told, uh, <laughs> uh, is that uh, you actually get more options. You have, you know, you have more choices, more, you're more of society, more of the goods of the world are, are available to you than uh, those less fortunate. And uh, what disturbed me a little bit in this approach is it sounds a whole lot like pay to play. And one of the obligations of a planner is to think of equity and think of choices that are being made. And to the extent you can, working with your existing frameworks, pr pr provide more choices for people that have the fewest choices now. And it just seems like this may be another example of pay to play where you require more sophisticated folks, more access to technology, and it might actually uh, uh, exacerbate discre discrepancies rather than overcome them. Okay, thank, thanks for that comment. I, I think these are really important concerns to think about. Um, one of the things about using things that are like option mechanisms is that it enables you to kind of make people put their money where their mouth is in a sense. And so it's a way of kind of testing for sincerity and testing for intensity of preferences. It's not perfect given that we have pre-existing wealth disparities. So we could certainly imagine um, having local governments craft choices in ways that are not tied to actually paying money, but you get some sort of set of uh, tokens or chits or something that you're, you know, a bank of, um, of uh, sort of permits or something that you're enabled to use in certain ways. We can imagine doing things that would, that would try to um, get around that in, in, in certain contexts. 
Uh, there is sort of a separate issue that I, I think you're raising about is there kind of a digital divide? Is it the case that we would skew our participation in ways that would be unfortunate? Um, so I, I think you managed to actually attack both prongs of my options, the, uh, the, the money-based um, financial option kind of idea and also the participatory option in that, well, you know, people may, uh, only, only wealthier people may participate with their smartphones and so on. Um, I, I think that is a concern. I think that it, the, this technology is spreading quite a bit and that uh, a lot of times you might even have online interfaces that are available at public libraries that, uh, that people end up uh, being able to contribute to without a lot of, a lot of means. We could, we could actually also have pilot programs where local governments um, actually issue you some kind of a smart device, you know, for a period of time, for a study period. Uh, to try to work on the kind of participation issue. I didn't mention it in, in, in the talk, but I have thought about this as part of optimizing participation, that we have to think about whether we're getting a representative sample and whether we're, we're actually um, having everybody's interests being, uh, being represented. Time for one more question. Well, thank you very much for helping us open our thinking about the world around us. Um, and I like the approach. It, it reminds me of a lot of the things that I studied in economics, people's decision to choose between. So in some ways, I, I, just an observation that there's a lot of economic theory here. You gave planners three jobs. One is to optimize participation. The other is to use behavioral insights to frame the choices. Another is to pursue normative commitments but it seems like there's still a role that's missing, which is to look into the future and decide what's important out there that we should be addressing. So in other words, I think these are really reactive tools for implementation, which are, is important. But I'd like to hear your thoughts about the process for looking into the future, which I think is the, if possibly, the most valuable part of planning and deciding what are the issues that we're going to need to choose between as a way of setting the table up front. Okay, thanks. Um, so looking into the future, that, that's always really, really very difficult, right, for anyone. Um, I do think that part of the looking into the future may involve getting more people involved because we may be able to gather more information about the future that way. Um, but I understand part of your question to be saying, well, we need to be, we need, planners need to have as their job part of this kind of agenda setting of looking down the road and saying, for example, um, wow, a lot of people are starting to want to use, you know, solar panels, or we're starting to have a big issue with, um, you know, with, with certain changes that are, that are, that are likely to follow uh, climate change. So there may be things that planners have to identify in order to be able to then set up the options. I, I think that's certainly part of it. I, I didn't actually mean to suggest that I was giving, uh, that the things that I listed were sort of the exclusive domain of, uh, that that was all planners should do. Uh, those are some things that I think planners can't ever delegate. But, uh, but yeah, looking, looking into the future is um, something that, I guess it's a question of who has a comparative advantage, and it might depend on what facet of looking into the future we're talking about. It might be that we might have planners able to um, appreciate certain aspects of the problem based on things they've seen before for extrapolating from expert knowledge that they have, but then there may be other things that we actually can learn more by just involving more people. Would you join me in appreciating people? <laughs>